After Beijing passed the draconian Hong Kong law, the U.S. might revoke Hong Kong's special status. What implications does it bring? An expert tells us China's move to reign in Hong Kong is not an impulse, but years in the making. A city of nearly 3 million in China's Heilongjiang province braces for a second wave of CCP virus cases. Several neighborhoods now locked down. Rising tensions over continuing clashes between troops at the disputed Indochina border. Concerns of escalation as the military builds up on both sides. Twitter recently adding fact check labels to two of President Trump's tweets. And after pressure, also adding warning labels to two of China's foreign ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian's tweets on the virus origin. And the FBI issued a statement on a Chinese scientist who pleaded guilty to stealing $1 billion worth of trade secrets from an American company. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. Hong Kong takes a step away from autonomy and towards the Chinese Communist Party. Hong Kongers fear what the law means for human rights and pro-democracy protesters. China's state power on Thursday passed a draft resolution on a so-called national security law for Hong Kong. Once drafted, the legislation will be added to Annex 3 of Hong Kong's basic law, bypassing the scrutiny of Hong Kong's legislature. The session made a decision to establish a legal system and enforcement mechanisms for the national security of Hong Kong's special administrative region. It was approved with a vote of 2,878 in favor, one against, and six abstentions. The draft national security law has received international criticism, along with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo declaring Hong Kong is no longer autonomous. Hong Kong has freedoms not granted in the mainland, such as freedom of assembly and freedom of the press, freedoms which this law threatens to take away. Hong Kong residents, fearing the loss of these rights, assembled in an upmarket shopping mall on Thursday to voice their concerns. One Hong Konger said she worries about the implications of the law on pro-democracy protesters. What will happen to the protesters? Does our next generation in Hong Kong need to be taken to re-education camps like those in Xinjiang? I think this is the most worrying thing to us, to all the people here. Large numbers of people have come out into the streets of the financial center to protest in recent days. Pro-democracy activist Joshua Wong says Hong Kongers are living through a nightmare. And with such evil law suggested by Beijing to impose in Hong Kong, we really encourage and enhance more global community to keep an eye on Hong Kong, to oppose the national security law. Wong supports Pompeo's recommendation of economic sanctions against China and those involved in the law. He urged President Trump, as well as the international community of world leaders, to take action against Beijing. The U.S., Australia, Canada and the U.K. released a joint statement cautioning Beijing that its decision lies in direct conflict with the legally binding UN-registered Sino-British Joint Declaration. It says Beijing's move risks losing the trust and cooperation needed among international players during the pandemic. Beijing's step today further advances the possibility for the U.S. to revoke Hong Kong's special status. Big changes would be on the horizon if the U.S. starts treating Hong Kong as one and the same with mainland China. China officially passed legislation today to quell Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement that started last summer. The new law by Beijing will criminalize activities in Hong Kong that Chinese authorities deem security threats. China says the law will be implemented as early as August and that there is no need for approval from Hong Kong's legislature. The law also allows secret police from China to openly operate in Hong Kong. Opposition groups worry their activities will be banned. Critics say the law might destroy Hong Kong as an international finance hub. The city's prosperity relies on its freedom and rule of law. In response to Beijing's new law, the U.S. has declared that Hong Kong is no longer autonomous. That could lead to a revocation of Hong Kong's special status under U.S. law. The decision is in the hands of President Trump. The U.S. treats Hong Kong differently from mainland China under a 1992 act. If the special status is revoked, major implications are involved. Hong Kong exports would be subject to the tariffs and restrictions the U.S. put on Chinese goods during the trade war. And Hong Kong may also face restrictions when buying sensitive technologies from the U.S. 
Hong Kong dollars enjoy free exchange with U.S. dollars, which is also subject to change if the special status is no more. The city accounts for two-thirds of China's foreign investment inflows. The decline of the city as a financial center could hurt China's foreign investment. <laughs> Beijing's infringement on Hong Kong's autonomy has also caused U.S. lawmakers to consider sanctioning Chinese banks operating in Hong Kong. The Senate has introduced a bipartisan bill that would punish Chinese banks that help Beijing's official enforce the new law. According to a Hong Kong media report, one option the U.S. has is to ban such banks from using the SWIFT system. The messaging system is essential for most banks to complete trades with other banks. This could bring substantial pain to China's economy, whose international business relies on dollar transactions that mostly happen in Hong Kong. Given the strict capital control, it will be hard for any mainland Chinese city to replace Hong Kong. Hong Kong protesters see Beijing's economic reliance on Hong Kong as one of the only leverages they have to argue for their freedom. The protesters have been pushing world leaders to reassess Hong Kong's autonomy. President Trump says he will give a news conference Friday regarding China. From proposal to approval, it's only one week for Beijing to pass a law that could end Hong Kong's autonomy. Why is China making this move now and why so fast? An expert explains. Within a week, Beijing has passed a so-called national security law that could put an end to Hong Kong's freedom. The move took many by surprise, but a China expert says the plan has been years in the making. Hong Kong's social demographic is actually a threat for the Chinese Communist Party. A Chinese general once revealed in a speech how communist elites see Hong Kong. He studied the city's demographics after the 1997 handover and said he thinks people in Hong Kong are hostile to the Communist Party. He claims it's due to their origins. He divided people in Hong Kong into three groups. One third is made of those born and raised in Hong Kong while it was still a British colony. They support the rule of law and democracy. Another third is made up of mainlanders and their descendants who escaped to Hong Kong in order to avoid the Chinese Communist Party's political persecution. The rest are those who smuggled themselves over the border during China's three-year famine some 60 years ago. Many of them couldn't bear the starvation and escaped to Hong Kong. They really hate the communist regime. One big problem for the regime is that Hong Kong shares close ties with mainland China. In 2019, over 40 million people from the mainland visited Hong Kong, which presents an opportunity for them to see things the regime would rather they didn't witness. Hong Kongers still enjoy the freedom to rally, parade and protest, but those in China do not. Mainland Chinese people are also prohibited from buying or reading books critical of the party. In the words of the Communist Party, Hong Kong will have a bad influence on the people from mainland China. This is what the CCP is most afraid of, so it has been trying to change the city. China affairs analyst Qin Peng has said for years that the regime has been working to infiltrate Hong Kong. But when Beijing tried to push an extradition law last year, almost two million Hong Kongers took to the streets to protest. The reaction gave the party something to think about. People in Hong Kong haven't changed as thoroughly as the party would like, so it feels that it needs to push stronger action in order to change their values, their social composition, and their space for free speech. Hong Kong's value to the party has also decreased. At the time of the 1997 handover, Hong Kong accounted for over 18 percent of China's GDP, but in 2018 it was only over 2 percent. At the same time, China has grown significantly since joining the World Trade Organization. It now stands as the world's second largest economy. But the Chinese regime is also facing an unprecedented crisis. Its economy has taken a hit from the virus pandemic, and dissent is brewing among Chinese people, threatening the party's dominance. For the Communist Party, pushing the move on Hong Kong right now is actually a good opportunity for it to transfer its domestic conflict. According to Chin, the party expected sanctions from the West to follow its move on Hong Kong. But despite the economic hardship, the penalties would allow China to place the blame for its recession on a foreign enemy. 
Doing so would help redirect attention of those who criticize the regime and thus reduce the pressure it's facing. Reporting by Juliet Song, NTD News. Mudanjiang City only reported a handful of new cases of the CCP virus over the past few days, but it's still suspending 90 percent of scheduled trains with no specific notice on resuming service. Some schools are also closed again. On May 27th, Mudanjiang bus terminal was closed. At least nine neighborhoods are now locked down. A May 25th video shows workers preparing to seal the entrance of a residential building with an iron fence. The person taking the photo says it's scary. Another video shows them installing the gate. A police car is parked close by. The entrance to this neighborhood is blocked. Local resident Ms. Zhen told us she doesn't believe the official figures. She said there should be more cases because the situation is serious. Many restaurants reopened for a few days and then closed again. Authorities use health codes to track who may have been exposed to the virus. Ms. Zhen says many people in the area can no longer leave the city because their health code has been downgraded. I don't think it's only those few people who are infected. The government never reports accurate figures. The Internet here is too heavily regulated by the government. Some messages are blocked even before you see them. Many accounts are also blocked, many chat groups. Ms. Jin said many people, including herself, lost their jobs. There is no financial aid from the government and she has to borrow money to make ends meet. The U.S.-China Commission released a report yesterday on the risks to the U.S. posed by the Chinese banking sector. The regime has ordered two different things that are conflicting with each other. Firstly, Chinese banks are pressured to clean up balance sheets, raise new capital and dispose of bad loans. Secondly, Beijing is forcing the same banks to boost lending to struggling companies in efforts to stem the economic slowdown from the pandemic. But this poses a risk to U.S. investors and creditors. And Tesla's Chinese rival, electric vehicle startup NIO, missed its quarterly revenue estimates. Sales in China fell by 31 percent during the pandemic. Twitter recently fact-checked two of President Trump's tweets about mail-in ballots being vulnerable to fraud. Trump was outraged and accused the platform of political bias. The New York Post then pointed out the double standard to Twitter's spokesperson, saying dubious tweets by China's foreign ministry spokesmen weren't treated the same. The tweets from March claimed the virus began in the U.S. rather than China. Originally, the spokesman said the labels would not be added at this time. But after reflecting, China's foreign ministry spokesman's tweets were also labeled with warnings for viewers to get the facts about COVID-19. The New York Times is reporting that the U.S. will cancel the visas of Chinese grad students and researchers who have direct ties to China's military. The ban would affect around 3,000 students. This comes amid concerns of national security threats, especially in the scientific sector. But if passed, China could impose its own visa restrictions on American students. And the FBI issued a notice after Chinese scientists pleaded guilty to stealing trade secrets estimated at $1 billion from a U.S. petroleum company. The FBI says it's just the latest example of the Chinese regime's systematic campaign to gain economic advantage by stealing the innovative work of U.S. companies and facilities. More and more countries, institutions and individuals are suing the Chinese Communist Party or its leader Xi Jinping for covering up the epidemic. A Chinese official has now proposed the Foreign State Immunity Act, which would enable Chinese people to file lawsuits in Chinese courts against foreign governments, institutions and individuals. He said this proposal is in counter to some countries, quote, accusing Chinese government of covering up the pandemic and suing the Chinese regime. China and India are on high alert amid an ongoing border standoff. Concerns over possible military escalation between the two nuclear-armed powers is rising. Tensions between China and India are rising over their disputed border, and both sides have increased their military presence there in response. 
Since early May, soldiers have faced off in areas like the Himalayan Ladakh region and North Sikkim region. Hundreds of troops engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and stone throwing, resulting in minor injuries. The Chinese border troops resolutely safeguard the national sovereignty and security, resolutely respond to infringement activities by the Indian side across the border. We remain firm in our resolve to ensuring India's sovereignty and national security. There's no official boundary line between China and India. The 2,500-mile-long Line of Actual Control, or LAC, serves as the de facto border. Difference in perception of the Line of Actual Control between the two countries, which has been there for a very long time, and uh, therefore confrontations take place. The dispute is the most serious conflict between the two countries in recent years. No bullets have been fired since a brief war in 1962, but scuffles break out now and then. A similar standoff lasted for over two months in 2017. For now, it appears the two Asian powers are trying to settle the dispute diplomatically. But the latest round of talks over the weekend ended without a resolution. Both sides have since stationed thousands of troops along the border in preparation for a long-term conflict. Recently, the Chinese communist regime has been expanding its presence in the region, and now India is playing catch-up. According to a former Indian official, the regime sees India's construction efforts in the region, aimed at bolstering infrastructure, as competition to the Chinese regime's Belt and Road Initiative. He says it could be the trigger behind the escalation. And on Tuesday, Chinese leader Xi Jinping ordered the CCP military to step up combat readiness and prepare for the worst-case scenario. Jobs are heading in the right direction, with states reopening, workers returning, and some businesses even hiring. Total unemployment has dropped for the first time since the pandemic began. It's a sign businesses are starting to bring workers back. And the number of first-time unemployment claims has also fallen for the eighth straight week. 2.1 million people signed on last week compared with 2.4 million the week before. And good news for Amazon's temp workers hired during the crisis. It's offering 125,000 of them a full-time position. But total unemployment still remains historically high, with 2.1 million people still unemployed, and not all businesses are scaling up. American Airlines is planning to reduce staff by 30 percent. Amtrak, too, will lay off 20 percent. Economists are now hoping for more people to return to work as states continue to reopen. The lockdowns in New York City are making life difficult for business owners and employees. We spoke with one small clothing store owner in Queens. He says we may see even more problems if employees aren't allowed to get back to work soon. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the story. Jose owns a clothing store in Queens, New York. The monthly rent for his storefront is about $14,000. Right now, he's not allowed to welcome customers into his store because the city is still locked down. He turned to the government for stimulus money, but had no luck. And I apply for uh, like grant uh, uh, loan, but I was not able to get it because they look for who has better credit and uh, they look for how the situation in the bank going. He even tried getting a private loan to tide him over, but they also turned him down because he hadn't been banking with them long enough. With sheriffs patrolling the area, he doesn't dare to reopen the inside of his store. But he's found a new way to make money, to help his employees and himself make ends meet, even if he only makes a third of what he used to. He now sells masks and hand sanitizer in front of his shop. And I'm trying to work outside because I don't want to get a problem with nobody, so I'm trying to make a living. It doesn't matter, I mean, how much I could make a day as long as I have the food on my table. He's not worried about being evicted from his store if he doesn't pay rent during the lockdown because the state won't allow it. But once things get back to normal, he may have to come up with the unpaid rent in a court settlement with his landlord. I like to work very hard, but if, if I can make it here, it's okay. If not, I have to go find some other solution, which is, I, which is uh, we have no choice. We have no choice. Since Jose sells essential supplies outside, he's able to keep his employees working. But he says the lockdowns are hurting a lot of employees because if they're not allowed to work, they may have to resort to begging or stealing to feed themselves. Reporting from New York, Kevin Hogan, NTD News.
Germany's flag carrier is close to receiving a bailout of 9 billion euros by the German government. But the EU is concerned about competition and is making demands. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin has more. The pandemic has almost grounded the entire airline industry. Europe's second largest carrier Lufthansa has been losing 1 million euros every hour and needs a lifeline to survive. A new rescue deal by the German government will provide Lufthansa with 9 billion euros. In exchange, the state gets a 20% stake in the company as well as two members on Lufthansa's board. Some are concerned about the political influence this may bring. In the past, Lufthansa was a very successful airline company. The fact that we now see a very strong influence on their company is bad news for the German economy. The EU Commission, which needs to sign off on the deal, is worried about competition in Europe. It doesn't want Lufthansa to become too strong, with the German government as a large shareholder. So Brussels wants the company to give up valuable landing slots to competitors. On Wednesday, Lufthansa's supervisory board said it cannot accept this condition. At 9 billion euros, the Lufthansa bailout is the largest airline rescue plan in Europe during this crisis. The French government gave Air France a 7 billion euro loan, while Italy renationalized Alitalia for 3 billion. Besides preserving jobs, European governments also want to avoid hostile takeovers of their flag carriers. But what are the downsides of these bailouts for the industry? We need some restructuring in the airline industry. There are overcapacities there. All the rescue programs that we currently see all over the continent tend to prolong this process. Chancellor Angela Merkel wants to make the deal happen and reportedly said she is ready for a tough fight with the EU Commission. Reporting by Christian Watson, NTD News, Berlin. California's governor reached out to the gyms and fitness community to get insight on how to reopen gyms. A gym owner expressed his struggles during the lockdown, while others offer suggestions on new protocols. California Governor Gavin Newsom and his staff told gym owners and fitness instructors virtually they will soon have guidelines for reopening gyms. We want to actually uh, take some real guidance from you, take uh, your insight and your thoughtfulness and your learnedness uh, and really develop a framework and guidelines that will be meaningful that we hope to put out in the very, very near future. But Newsom and his staff did not give an exact date and said counties will be taking the lead. We are we have draft guidance right now that is working its way through our California Department of Public Health and um, our various sectors to make sure that we get this right. We expect it to get out very soon. One gym owner made an emotional plea to Newsom, saying money is running out for him and others in the fitness community due to the lockdown. We can't wait. I cannot afford to wait much longer than a week at this stage. We are literally gasping for air. We have the protocols. We are safe. I know that a lot of my friends in this community that have helped me develop these protocols are right in the same position that I'm in. And Governor, we need your help. We need to do this very soon. Atia was allowed to reopen his gym last week through local health officials, only to have it shut down by state authorities. Fitness instructors and owners talk about new protocols they hope will help the reopening. Big things such as spacing out our floor and using painter's tape to create distancing. Um, big things like designating a pair of shoes that's only worn inside of our facility. Newsom did not say what suggestions would be adopted. America's economy contracted 5% in the first quarter of 2020, the sharpest decline since the 2007 to 2009 Great Recession. And mortgage rates are even more affordable. Here are your business briefs. America's economy contracted at a 5% pace in the first quarter of 2020. It's the sharpest decline since the Great Recession. The Commerce Department said the 5% drop in economic output is a downward revision from a preliminary estimate of an annualized 4.8%. And mortgage rates fell again. They now are at an average of 3.15% for a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. That beats the record low set in April. It's the third time this year for a new record low. Nissan Motor outlined a new plan to become a smaller, more cost-efficient car maker. The virus pandemic caused a slide in profitability, giving the company its first annual loss in 11 years. 
We need to do things which we haven't done enough of, such as to admit failures and take corrective actions to get back on track and to conduct a reorganization of surplus assets, which we cannot not expect to recover. Under a new four-year plan, Nissan will slash production capacity and model range by about one-fifth to help cut $2.8 billion from fixed costs. JCPenney plans to start store closing sales as soon as June. The company filed for bankruptcy in May. Stores want sales to revolve around the back-to-school season, but it's not yet clear if schools will reopen for the upcoming school semester. The company plans to close 30% of its 846 stores over the next few years. And in France, churches are among the first to reopen to the public as the country eases lockdown measures. Parishioners are making the trip to come together, clad in masks and staying a safe distance away. Our France correspondent David Vives has the story. Priests and cars. Churchgoers in France are coming together again after two months of virus lockdown. There's mass on television, but it's not the same as being with a community during Sunday mass. In Paris this week, 100 yards from the Louvre, Church Saint Roch is open. Known for welcoming renowned artists over the years, it's adorned with masterpieces. Social distancing signs are up. So people are washing hands, they are wearing masks, they are seated to uh, reasonable distance one to another. Bishop Laurent says people are more sensitive to their spirituality in difficult times and they need to gather. We are normally, naturally, communicable people. Eh? We have to, to share, to speak, to, to shake hands, to, uh, in France it's very important, uh, even to kiss to those who are closer one to another. France's Council of State last week ordered the government to lift its ban on all religious services, saying it caused damage that is serious and manifestly illegal. The country is set to enter a new phase next week, with a gradual easing of lockdown measures, including reopening public spaces like swimming pools, libraries, retail stores and eventually cafes and restaurants. Reporting by David Vives, NTD News, Paris. One of the world's most celebrated chefs, Guy Savoie, opened one of his four Paris restaurants for takeout after France partially relaxed some lockdown restrictions earlier this month. To satisfy their diners' cravings for haute cuisine, Le Chibertat is offering menus to go for 55 euros, half the price of its regular tasting menu. We wanted to do this to show people that we're still here, still here to help them keep up their spirits, to tell our customers there is still the opportunity to eat something of good quality at our restaurant so they don't forget us. Wednesday's menu had roasted stone bass with fennel, a spring salad for appetizer and chocolate mousse for dessert. The products are of very high quality, and then there's the creativity, the reflection behind the dishes and the taste. I think that's what makes these takeout dishes resemble a meal in a Michelin-starred restaurant. The dishes come in carton containers instead of fancy plating. The takeout boxes also come with instructions on how to properly reheat chicken or artichoke soup. A law office assistant who works nearby came to pick up two menus for clients to help support the restaurant. This is to support Lee Shaberta, to help them get by somehow, hoping that things would get better and that they reopen very soon. Since the takeaway service launched on May 13th, two of Le Chibertat's seven kitchen team members have come back to work, while others are still on furlough. Le Chibertat is delivering about 35 meals a day, but the takeaways only make about 10 to 15 percent of its average revenue before the lockdown. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe for the latest updates, and see you tomorrow.